Hi everyone, welcome to Last Book Alive. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, a book called Minor Detail by Adania Shibli. Uh, this is the cover. And this is my third attempt at recording, so excuse me if the energy level is a little low. But uh, yeah, I was supposed to discuss this book with a friend, uh, but she is traveling, so it'll just be me. Uh, and uh, let's just get straight into it. But before that, I just wanted to let you guys know that this year, I'm only going to be talking about uh, literature from Palestine. That includes uh, fiction, but it also includes poetry and nonfiction. And uh, also, like, there is an attempt, uh, a thought, an intention to also learn about what's happening in Sudan and DRC. But that is for later. Um, that is for a later part of the year. Uh, and I hopefully will be able to get some more information on that because I think that both of those countries, it's e equally important to talk about them. And uh, so far as I have seen, there isn't that uh, as much discussion about them. So that's still on the radar. When it will happen, I'm not sure, but I just wanted to let you know. And uh, if you have any suggestions on books that I could read about Sudan or DRC, please do let me know. Um, okay, so minor detail. This is a novel written in two parts. It was published in 2017. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's written by Palestinian author Adania Shibli. And it was translated into English by Elizabeth Jacquet. Uh, and I believe that was in the year 2020. So uh, there's some controversy surrounding, uh, surrounding this book, or rather the Frankfurt Book Fair is the, is the culprit. Uh, last year in October, uh, Shibli was supposed to receive an award at the Frankfurt Book Fair um, and it was by a German literary agency called Lit Prom and uh, this award ceremony was called off and Shibli says that she was disinvited uh, in an interview with The Guardian uh, because Lit Prom cited the Hamas-led uh, war as the reason. Uh, this prompted 350 authors from around the world to write an open letter uh, to the Frankfurt Book Fair, accusing it of shutting down Palestinian voices. And uh, you can find the link to this letter as well as Lit Prom statement uh, on their website, uh, which is uh, ridiculous because it separates, it tries to uh, underplay the reason why they did what they did. Uh, you know, Palestinian author not awarded because of Hamas led war, but there's not, no connection between the two. Uh, so it's kind of a ridiculous statement and I would welcome you to look at it. Um, and it'll be in the links in the captions. Um, okay, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about this book. Uh, the two parts uh, are very, very different from each other. The first part is very factually written. It's uh, almost like a government document about an account that happened. This first part is the account of the rape. The second part is much more, uh, the narrative is much more closer to the, per, to the narrator. Uh, and it's an account of a woman who finds out, who seeks to investigate what happened in the first part, which is the rape. Um, so the first part, uh, which is about the rape, it is about the rape uh, and murder of a young Bedouin girl in the Negev desert uh, in 1949. The Negev Desert is actually called Naqab uh, Desert in Arabic. This actually, this incident actually did take place in real life. It did happen in 1940-49 in August in Negev Desert. And what happened was uh, that the Israeli Defense Force unit caught and held captive a Bedouin girl. They gang raped her and they killed her. The platoon commander who did this was called Moshe. And the person who killed it was Sar uh, killed her was Sergeant Mike Michael. So this story is based on this true account of of of, of what happened. Um, and uh, this this is obviously a fictionalized account, but it is based on real events. Um, the second part uh, is is where uh, there's a Palestinian woman who's living in Ramallah and who tries to uncover what happened in 1949. And why she does that is also really interesting. It's because she was born on the same day as, uh, as the day that this girl was killed, which was August 13, 1949. Um, 
before I get into um, before I get into this novel, I just wanted to share what I recently found out is happening in the Israel Gaza war. So, 13th January, which was yesterday, marks 100 days of war in Gaza. Uh, Oxfam has said that the Israeli military is killing 250 Palestinians per day. The link to that statement is going to be also in the captions. I did try uh, to search, uh, to kind of research and to share with you the entire history of the conflict or just like the highlights, right, from the Balfour dec Declaration and then the annexation uh, of Palestine by, by the UK, uh, which is a nice way of saying colonization by the UK of Palestine. Um, yeah, so, uh, but because it's such a, this history, there's a lot of, there are a lot of details and it requires a lot of time and I didn't want to be wrong about it. So I have left it for another time uh, where I want to discuss the history, but also the problem, I, problem, I, problematization of this history like um how israel completely has a contextualized its violence or seeks to do that as if the palestinians are the ones who are occupying so how history and the narrative has has been completely changed by israel and the media um and and this actually connects to something that i was going to discuss later on but since i've talked about the narrative I just want to mention that, you know, I was looking, because the story is about rape, uh, I was looking at, uh, you know, sexualized violence in Palestine uh, and instances of it. So what is the data on it? How many, you know, people have been, you know, raped or, you know, sexually like harassed or tortured uh, by the Israeli military? And you can, you can search for it as well. Uh, you won't find anything. <laughs> the first page of Google, all that it has is how Hamas has tortured and raped uh, Israeli uh, women hostages, uh, right? Which is ABC has reported on it. All the major mainstream news outlets, their focus is on Hamas and sexualized violence that has been perpetrated by Hamas. But on the other hand, there is no data, there's no information on Israel and what it may be doing on the ground. Uh, and a glimpse of it is that you know there there is this uh, there was a writer who was released just a month ago from an Israeli prison and she claimed that she was threatened with rape uh, by an Israeli uh, officer. So um, you know I mean we do have this account and I'm sure that if if one digs there will be different accounts of it. Um, there is this Israeli soldier Umar Tabib who was actually killed in the line of duty. He was 21. He actually claimed on his Twitter account that he raped a Palestinian woman. And obviously that has not been verified or corroborated in any way. Uh, but, you know, so what I'm trying to say is that there's no data on it. And all, almost as if the narrative is that Israeli soldiers don't do this, right? So, and it's so pervasive. Uh, at least like if, if somebody just has, is, is, just has a glimpse of it, uh, just by a simple search, you won't find anything. Anyway, so back to back to the discussion. Um, yeah, so I wanted to um, start with the use of symbolism, um, the use of uh, actually, yeah, I mean, what there are two there are two creatures that that basically caught my attention in this book. Uh, the first is the dog and it's constant incessant barking and the other other and the other is a spider or a creature that or the or a creature that is actually not described or or talked about but that bites the platoon commander at the very beginning uh, and when the spider bites him his wound gets infected and then even more infected until it becomes very disgusting and he starts hallucinating and losing control of his faculties um so, you know, I, I don't know what these two represent. Uh, you know, I was actually thinking about it like, so where does the dog appear? The dog is, is uh, the dog and his incessant barking, it runs throughout the novel in the first part as well as the second part, uh, right? So, um, and we, we come across the dog uh, when the Bedouin girl is, 
kidnapped from her uh you know from her home so the the dog follows her and stays with her and he is barking constantly at the platoon commander at the other soldiers and things like that so uh, is he is the dog like a witness to what is happening is is he maybe the part of our mind that cannot make sense when it's when it's faced with trauma is it the anger of the palestinians um is he the guardian spirit angel you know for the for the girl and who tries to stand guard for her but can't uh is is it the girl herself that part of her that seeks to protect her but can't uh because it's the dog is both it's like a witness to the cruelty but while i'm reading it it's also cruelty itself it's kind of like vengeance actually you know it, it's 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 a symbol of vengeance I, i think because it refuses to go away it's always there and and the noise the barking is always there so even when i was reading it it was almost like i was being interrupted in the narrative by this dog's barking and i was like shut up you know i want to read the novel you know that that was what, that happened once um and then this this bite that this that this platoon commander has right i i could not understand how that why that happened why did the writer why did shivli cho- choose to put this detail in in the novel right and, and again like i use the word detail and i'm reminded of of the numerous details that are present in, in all parts of this book you know and why it's a detail and it's not a complete comprehensible block of information it's just a detail is that it comes and goes you know and you blink and you miss it so even the bite it's interesting because i wanted to know what happened like you know was it a spider was it some other weird creature what was it we never find out you know and how he gets the bite is that he's basically lying down and suddenly he feels something on his thigh and then he mo- removes it and it crawls away but well, we don't know what it is you know and uh you know and then yeah we slowly see this wound become infected you know and it almost to me felt like it was his mind that was getting infected you know but the other thing uh, is that sometimes uh like okay for instance in homeopathy for instance i wish my friend denise was here but in in homeopathy there is this belief that when you see the wound it means it's healing so whatever is inside you homeopathy whatever impurities or infection you have inside you homeopathy draws it out right so it's in you and then it draws it out and then it heals it so if i look at it that way then maybe the wound or the infection was always there inside him like he was he was himself like a wound like an infection you know and the creature biting was just a prompt for that infection that that rot to come out of him you know and then not not completely heal him just stay with him you know um i don't know that that's just one thought that i had um but anyway so um so yeah this this novel is full of details and the writing is very detailed um shibli really stretches out the commander's suffering right and i think that that is one way of perhaps us feeling kind of like maybe this is his punishment you know because he doesn't actually get punished the the novel abruptly the first part abruptly ends with the death of the bedouin girl the story ends we don't know what happened to the to the commander right um but before that prior to that his suffering is really stretched out so we see the wound she describes it in detail you know and she describes his cleaning rituals in detail like it's almost as if as the wound makes him less in control of the situation his cleaning ritual keep is the thing that keeps him in control you know and um you know like uh when uh, there was there was a part where i was actually hoping that he would protect the girl so he takes the girl from the tent to his room uh, you know and i thought that maybe the wound was maybe like a way that you know he it's a it's a painful situation for him so maybe he can empathize with the girl 
and but then he takes her into the room and that's where you know he rapes her so that obviously fell to the wayside but um yeah i mean it's a it's actually a very what what makes the first novel stand out the first part of the novel stand out is how removed it is from the girl's suffering actually and how removed it is from the entire situation you know and i think that that that's an interesting choice that shivli made i i don't know why she made it uh it could have been a first hand account from the girl's perspective but um i don't know like as i reflect on it i think sometimes trauma is we can only write about certain kinds of trauma from a distance because to write about it from a place that's closer it's just not possible because we're so close to it you know uh that the writing of it the articulation of it just cannot happen so maybe that was the reason um anyway moving forward so yeah i wanted to actually this is a part that i wanted to read it it is about the girl and her interaction with the soldiers um and yeah it it it's brutal so just a warning if you're not really you know in the space to listen to this then don't um okay the soldiers glanced at each other and at the girl curled into a ball on the sand shivering until the soap arrived and it slid from the soldier's palm to his to the sand and to the sand at her feet he pointed at the bar of soap this is the platoon commander he pointed at the bar of soap with his right hand which was still holding the hose while his left hand circled around his head and chest she remained motionless and a few stifled laughs came from the direction of the soldiers then staring directly into her eyes the platoon commander shouted at her ordering her to pick up the soap and immediately the soldiers laughing and mutterings fell silent leaving only the dogs panting which chafed against the air slowly the girl reached her hand towards the soap and picked it up water trickled down her body she straightened slightly and began moving the soap in circles over her head then her chest which was soon covered with a fine layer of white suds concealing for a moment the brown of her skin as she did he looked down at the circle of wet sand besieging her the water had not escaped very far the sand immediately around her feet had soaked it all up when he raised his gaze back to the girl soap suds were covering most of her body especially her front he took his thumb off the hose and water gushed through it again but he quickly pinched the nozzle with his thumb and forefinger making the water shoot harder and further and aimed it at the girl he began removing the soap from her body sometimes pushing suds to areas the bar had not reached by pointing the hose and aiming the stream of water flowing from it after removing most of the soap from her body he covered the nozzle of the hose with his thumb and ordered the tap to be turned off not directing his words at anyone in particular while commotion rose around him again the dog continued standing there tense and alert its tongue trembling as it panted nervously yeah so yeah this 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 is heavy um yeah and and you know yesterday i was um i was researching on uh, on kashmir and uh and the sexual violence that has taken place in kashmir over the years because kashmir and palestine um they have this link of solidarity and kashmiris have always shown up for palestinians um through protests and uh, you know sermons at on fridays and things like that and recently their protests have been curbed uh, by the indian government just like the indian government has curbed uh, it in all other cities uh in fact in aligarh i think students were jailed uh for protesting in support of uh palestinians 
So, um, yeah, it's it's heavy to 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 read this, and also then to remember uh, because I read about. Um, What was it? It was the, it was a, yeah, the Kunan Pashpura uh, rape, where uh, two villages, uh, two villages adjacent to each other, close to the border, um, the women and girls were raped in that village. Um, this happened a long time ago. Uh, and I don't have the details of the dates, but I do remember reading the accounts. And there's a book also, which I will link in the, in the captions that has been written about it, uh, which is, do you remember Kunan Poshpura? Um, but yeah, so we will get into how women's bodies are weaponized uh, during war and conflict and occupation. Um, but, um, but I think it is important to document these incidents and it is important to report on them and as difficult as, as it is it is important to talk about talk about them that this did happen um and so i'm really like i think this novel is incredible in that it does go back so far in the past pulls out this fact and creates you know creates literature out of it um because that is one way of dealing with pain with painful events is that we make sense of it through fiction. Um, so yeah. Uh, another theme uh, that was present throughout the book that I noticed was how the dead returned to guide the Palestinian woman on her journey to finding out the truth about what happened to the Bedouin girl. So she sees um, a barking dog um, and she sees an old woman, she gives an old woman a ride who then disappears. Um, she sees a young girl in a tent, but she thinks that she imagined her. And I don't know, part of me was like, is she seeing, is she seeing the young girl who, who was murdered at different stages of her life, you know, as a young girl, as she was before what happened to her. And then as an old woman, had she lived out her life? and uh yeah i mean it's maybe really sad um and then there was a there's a there's a part where she's trying to get out of the car to find out you know because she thinks that this is the place where the where the girl lived or that's where her village was or just trying to find out what you know somebody whom she can talk to and a dog comes up to her and he barks at her so she cannot get out of the car and i wonder whether it was to protect her you know to keep her in the car and one thing now that strikes me is that wherever she went, this Palestinian woman in, in what is now Israel, uh, these are Israeli settles, settlements that she went to, uh, she, did, she didn't really find that many people. It was almost like it was deserted. Like there are lots of descriptions of the, the place being barren, deserted, not a soul in sight. And so that's interesting too, because here, um, because the narrative that Israel has come up with is that, you know, it's, it was empty, like the Palestine, there was no Palestine. And then they suddenly came and they, you know, started living here. And this is kind of like a reverse narrative, right? Because here the occupied goes into the occupier's land and then finds nobody there, like literally nobody there, you know, and the place is actually deserted. Uh, so that's an, that was an interesting kind of uh, twist or, you know, changing of, of the narrative. Uh, which I thought was really clever. Um, um, so when I when I ended the first part, obviously I stopped and took a walk because it needed that kind of space to process. And then I came to uh, and then I came to the second part, and um, it was such a shift from the first. First of all, there was not so much of a feeling of dread or heaviness. It was like lifted because. Um, you know it's about this woman and she's living in 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 ramallah and and yes it is occupied but she uh, she you know she starts off by saying how great her life is and how she loves cleaning her house and there's a bit of humor in in also the the narrator's voice uh you know like there's a tongue-in-cheek aspect to her to the way that she tells her story uh so i just wanted to read it 
um yeah i wanted to read the first page actually uh one second And the the first part is the first the first part is uh, written from a third person's perspective, and the for, the second part is written from the first person's perspective. So it's more, I guess maybe that was the reason why it felt closer to closer to the narrative felt closer to the narrative. Maybe is one way of saying it. Um, so this is the first uh, paragraph of of the for, of the second section. After I had finished hanging the curtains over the windows, I lay down on the bed. At that moment, a dog on the opposite hill began to howl incessantly. It was past midnight and I couldn't sleep, despite how thoroughly exhausted I was. I'd spent the whole day arranging and cleaning the house. I dusted the furniture, swept the floor, and rewashed the bed sheets and towels and most of the dishes, even though in principle the house was clean before I began cleaning it so be, before i began cleaning it so thoroughly the landlord told me he had brought in a woman especially i started renting this house a few days earlier right after getting my new job on the whole the house was good and the job is good and my colleagues are nice but none of this was enough to help me overcome the anxiety and fear that, that the dog's endless howling awakened in me that night not even a little so <laughs> Okay, I take my words back. This is not exactly happy, but uh, I like the idea of her just cleaning her house and taking care of it. Like, this is also another small detail that I found comforting. But obviously, she's not comforted because it's almost like this dog is, like, haunting her or chasing her. Um, and obviously, the dog's howling connects, connects the two stories very, very clearly and beautifully. So we're brought back. We're, we're kind of it's not separate at all we're we're the dog is the connection and it's howling is the connection between those two stories that the tragedy that ended in the first story has come into the second story has transferred over into the second story and so the pain kind of lives on in some ways um now i wanted to talk about the narrator so as i said like you know she she is somewhat there are humorous parts uh, to this second second bit uh, but also what's interesting about this narrator um, and again very cleverly done by Shibli right is that she has a fear of borders and what is what is her journey it's to cross borders so we have the hero's journey and we have this big uh, big obstacle in the middle that the hero or the heroine in this case has to cross so uh, yeah I, I just wanted to read that actually uh, her fear of borders she talks about mm. okay. uh, and obviously I can't find it okay here okay so this is what she says on the whole I realize that this might seem exaggerated but this is due to the issue I previously mentioned namely my inability to identify borders even very rational borders which makes me overreact sometimes or underreact at other times unlike most people for instance when uh, for instance when a military patrol stops the minibus i take to my new job and the first thing that appears through the door is the barrel of a gun i ask the soldier while stuttering most likely out of fear to put it away when he's talking to me or asking me to see my identity card at which point the soldier starts mocking my stutter and the passengers around me grumble because I'm overreacting. There's no need to make things so tense. So, yeah. Okay, so this lady who has a fear of borders decides, well, I have to go and find out what happened to this Bedouin girl in 1949 because she was killed on the same day that I was born and this is something that I'm destined to do. So she does. She sets out. She sets out on a journey and on paths that she has not taken in decades, okay? And her fear her is like physically manifested in her body with like shuddering and just cold sweating and things like that. And uh, 
um, there's one very sweet moment. I don't want to give away the whole novel, but you know what? You have to read it. I mean, there, you have no choice. This is an amazing novel and you have to read it. So I'm going to give this away. But there's a very sweet moment where she's at the checkpoint and she's very, very nervous. And this young child comes up to her and starts harassing her to buy chewing gum, okay? She's like, I don't want chewing gum. I don't chew gum, okay? The girl doesn't leave her alone. And so finally, she takes the gum and she puts it in her purse. And then we see later on, uh, you know, in her explorations, um, how the chewing gum actually comes comes in handy because she hasn't eaten anything, so she chews the gum, or she's nervous or afraid, then she chews the gum. So it's almost like the 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 little girl is kind of there with her, you know, or I don't know. It's just, it's just the chewing gum is providing her comfort, reminding her of home. Anyway, so uh, the thing about the thing about this. From here on out, we are with her from her journey from Ramallah to the Negev or Naqab Desert. And in this journey, uh, we find we find the geographical history of Palestine reflected in this in this Palestinian woman's journey, right? Um, geographical and visual so when she's looking how things have changed and she says oh there used to be a village right there and you know this road didn't used to be there you know and what does she have with her to make these comparisons she has two maps okay one is the map of palestine in 1948 and one is a recent map of israel and so she basically she's basically trying to figure out her her path where to go and so she constantly has to compare uh, the roads to understand which way she should go and my god what a be what a what a beautiful and poignant way to discuss the displacement of people the eradication of an entire people and their homes uh, from from a land that was theirs i mean so i i was just spellbound at the way that she did this you know like that she has these maps and she's like, am I going the right way? There used to be this village, but it's not there anymore. What happened, you know? Or she remembers, you know, she has very good memories. So she remembers, okay, this used to be here. You know, what happened to it, this, that. So, yeah. Um, and one of the one of the markers that, you know, she has crossed over um, into Israel, uh, as she crosses over, she sees the wall, okay? Now this wall actually does exist in real life. It's called the wall of apartheid. Um, and she, when she leaves Ramallah, that's, where she, that's when she sees it. And this wall uh, was, uh, Israel started building this wall in 2002, between 2002 and 2003. Um, and I actually checked, uh, I, I checked on Google Maps uh, to see how long it takes to go from Ramallah to the Naqab Desert. And it takes about three hours, 40, 40 minutes. And the exact place where she goes, which is Miriam, it's closer. It's like two hours something minutes. Um, so why does she have to actually travel all the way into Israel to find out more? Well, um, the archives where possibly the details of this uh, assault on this Bedouin girl are kept, uh, you know, have been recorded. These archives are in an area where, uh, which are on the side of Israel. So um, this actually reflects like how not just the you know, the people who commit the wrongdoing are also the ones who keep accounts of that wrongdoing. How not, they, they keep the knowledge of that wrong, wrongdoing. You know, it's in their hands, like all the accounts of whatever they did is, is in their hands. So even access to it, uh, you know, by the people who are seeking justice or seeking the truth, you know, it's difficult. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, and, and you know, like when she was doing this, when she was comparing like, uh, there's one place where she goes and it's uh, it's re it's been renamed Canada Park, okay? And that just reminded me of India because, you know, how we're going around renaming cities from Allahabad to Prayagraj, you know, uh, being the most ridiculous. Um, but yeah, like this renaming and reassigning of places, you know, as if you want to change, I mean, you do want to change like the memory of that place, that, you know, the place is ahistorical, it, 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 it Suddenly, because you change its name, it has no history, but it does. It always does. Um, okay, so um, so her first night, uh, you know, in 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 Israel, um, 
in and she's at the Israeli settlements, one of the Israeli settlements, that's where she spends the night. Uh, she hears sounds of bombs like far away, you know, like they're, they're at a distance and they're being launched into Gaza. And she starts to feel homesick. And um, that was one of the most like touching moments, but it was also like, it was such a deeply, deeply tragic moment as well, right? That um, the sound of bombs is reminding her of home. And she longs to be home. She longs to be, well, she's from Liv Ramallah, but like, you know, she said, like, you know, she, she longed to be in Gaza, to be with the people, uh, to be with her people. So I just, I wanted to read that. Um, She says, I listen intently to the sounds of the shelling and the heaviness of the sound translates my distance from the place being bombed. It's far, past the wall, in Gaza or maybe Rafa. Bombing sounds very different depending on how close one is to the place being bombed or how far. The rumblings from the shelling aren't strong at all and the noise isn't unsettling. Rather, it's a deep, heavy sound, like a languorous pounding on a massive drum and the bombs causing it don't shake the building I'm in, even though the walls are thin and made of light wood. They don't shatter the glass, even though the windows are closed. Like, this is what happens, right? Um, in Gaza, it's happening. And when I get out of bed and open the windows, the room isn't filled with a thick cloud of shuddersome dust. Instead, what sneaks inside is the soft, tender air of dawn. I keep listening. My ears train to the sound of repeated bombings, and I feel a strange closeness with Gaza, as well as a desire to hear the shelling from nearby and to touch motes of dust from the buildings being bombed. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so I've written like, you know, with the, the two maps that she has, it's almost like she's on these two parallel roads and they never meet, you know, these two parallel um, realities of like this tender dawn versus this dust filled glass shattered rooms, you know, um, yeah, and um, one of the one of the things I noted was that you know it kind of felt to me that her physical journey, uh, you know, through Israel, it almost reflects, you know, the journey that Palestine itself has made. You know, so in a way, she is Palestine, like, and she's going back in history to find out what happened. You know, it's it's like she's she's an embodiment of her country and her people, and they're kind of <laughs> sorry. And they're kind of going back in history um, to try to figure out this one minor detail, you know, as if, and it's, if you, if you look at the larger context, isn't it somewhat, I mean, what does it matter, right? One would say this one small detail, why does it matter? There are thousands upon thousands of people who have died. So why this one particular incident? Why are you obsessed with it? But somehow I think that she feels like maybe if she finds something about this, that everything in her life will make sense what is happening to her and what is happening to her people, it will make sense, you know. So, yeah, um, I did want to talk, a second to last thing that I want to talk about is how, um, so this, this, this novel is the core of it, the, uh, you know, you can say like the crux of it is that it begins with a rape and, uh, and murder of a young Bedouin girl. So uh, I wanted to talk about how rape is a weapon of war. Um, it's not, uh, according to the UN Women, and I'll link the source where I found this, but according to UN Women, quote, rape is not just the action of rogue soldiers, but a deliberate tactic of warfare. What it does is it obviously terrorizes and destroys individuals 
uh, and families, but also communities, because what it does is it, what what it does is that it holds communities hostage. So what happened in Konan Pushpura, like uh, many of the girls who, uh, who were assaulted, many of the women who were assaulted, they were unmarried. And so the women who were assaulted, who were married, deliberately did not share the details of these unmarried girls because they were afraid that they would not get married, right? So, and, and their lives would be ruined. And what I read is eventually that the people who, the, the, the villagers themselves distanced themselves from the families where this happened. So in a way, it's like, this is a way of terrorizing and isolating a community. Uh, it's, it's actually not a way, it's the way to, that's, that's what, uh, that's what uh, you know, occupying forces do is that they are holding communities hostage because because they have this impunity power to go ahead and do that and uh, in that in that uh, instance in that uh, mass rape nobody was held accountable and the testimonies of uh, the women were you know sidelined uh, and i really actually want to read this book uh, that i mentioned have you do you remember uh, what happened in Quran Pushpur, I'm probably not getting the title right, but I do want to read it and I will link it in the captions. Um, also the data on, on wartime rapes is underestimated and the actual figures are much higher. Um, the UN Women Report did mention figures from Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Bosnia and Herzegovina and DRC, but not from Palestine um, and not from Kashmir. Uh, and it's interesting because these places, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and DRC, they are known as places where genocide did happen. But now what about Palestine? What is happening in Palestine and who's documenting, who's collecting this data of the number of deaths and the number of pe uh, people who face sexual violence or torture? Um, so, and as I told you, uh, you know, that when I search for, for uh, articles on, on, you know, sexual violence in Palestine, I told you that all that came up was what Hamas did to these hostages. And that narrative, I, I personally question because the hostages that were coming out uh, mm -hmm. from being held by Hamas, their accounts were very different from what the media, mainstream media reported. Okay, so I'm not questioning it. But I am saying that there are these two different narratives that are coming out. Um, and the fact that all I could read was about Hamas and how they committed rape, it's kind of just very biased. Um, so, yeah. Um, but now uh, I think I'm going to end uh, my discussion. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think I think I'm just gonna end with a with a passage from the book. So this is when um, the narrator uh, meets the old woman, uh, who may or may not be the ghost of the girl who was uh, who was murdered. So this woman she meets on the side of her of the of her road that she's traveling on, she gives her a ride. She's probably in her 70s. The girl would have been around the same age now, most likely if she hadn't been killed. Maybe this old woman has heard about the incident, since incidents like that would have reached the ears of everyone living in the Naqab, terrorizing them all, and no one who heard about it would be able to forget. I could start by asking her about the area and how long she's lived here, then gradually transition to asking about the incident and if she knows anything about it. But the words do not emerge from my mouth. The silence between us stretches on, as vast as nature's silence expanding around us and tightens its grip until the old woman suddenly asks me to stop. And so I do, and she gets out. But before she does, she looks directly into my eyes. Then she turns and quietly retreats towards a sandy path to the left, which no one traveling on the asphalt road would notice or imagine might lead somewhere. 
The old woman continues to walk on the path until every trace of her vanishes into the sandy hills. So that's it for me for now, uh, for this month. Uh, I'll see you guys next month uh, on the 15th or earlier when I will be discussing Kanafani with my friend Reem. Uh, take care, you guys. Um, do please continue to watch what is happening in Palestine and uh, continue to show your support. You can donate uh, to various charities that are uh, operating there and also keep yourself and your friends and family informed about what's happening. Okay, take care. Have a good day. Bye.